Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on present truth in Deuteronomy. We've asked questions about that several times already. This is lesson number 12 for December 18 of 2021, and it's entitled Deuteronomy in the New Testament. I thought Deuteronomy was in the Old Testament. Well, let's figure out what's, how does Deuteronomy appear in the New Testament. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we bow before you now, recognizing your presence among us and guidance in our study of your word. Help us to realize the implications of the fact that so many people in the New Testament quoted from and used uh, the book of Deuteronomy. May we see why they did so as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. A careful investigation of the New Testament would show us that there are expressions from the Old Testament, even entire passages, uh, quoted in many places. Someone has done a very careful study of the book of Revelation and has suggested that there are more than 600 uh, stated or implied references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation alone. Jesus himself several times said, it is written, we're going we're gonna to focus on that a little bit later, what is what's implied by it is written, meaning written in the Old Testament since the New Testament had not yet been written. As recorded in Mark 14, 49, 49 he also said, the scriptures must be fulfilled. And which scriptures would those be? has to be in the Old Testament. Now, let's mention one thing in passing here really quickly. Scriptures literally means that which is written. And it doesn't mean everything that's written down is inspired. So we recognize that Jesus wasn't talking about anything that happens to be written down. He's talking about those books which have proved the test of time that they are in, from inspired writers and are, need to be followed. Furthermore, Jesus himself, after his resurrection, speaking to the two men on the road to Emmaus, and later to all of the disciples, used that opportunity to describe what the Old Testament said about him in the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings, also called the Psalms, because that was the first and longest book in the section called the Writings. And let me just read, look at those two verses. I think they're very significant. Look at Luke 24, 27. And Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. Moses said, books of Moses and writings of prophets. But then in verse 44, he said, then he said to them, now he's speaking to all the disciples, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms had to come true. Now that's a very significant passage for a number of reasons, apart from the fact that it shows that he recognized that the Old Testament was inspired. It also tells us that they had a pretty clear idea of what the, old, what the Bible was, what, which books were officially recognized by the, organism, the church, uh, the Jewish people at that point in time, as being part of the Old Testament. The books of Moses, the five books of Moses, the prophets, now the group, the ones, the books they included in the prophets are a little different than ours. They would, they included Joshua as a prophet and Judges as a, something about the prophets and so forth. But it's the same group that we have. Um, they're just grouped a little bit differently. So it so that even Jesus in his day recognized that these books are the ones that we we recognize. It should be obvious that since their their society and their religion were permeated with the ideas from the Old Testament, it will be, and, and when we say permeated, I should tell you that one of the main tasks of a young man, a young, starting with a, a child, a male child, because women almost never got to, stu got to study uh, in school, but the boys, they were expected to mem memorize major portions of the Old Testament in Hebrew if they were going to advance in their studies. And if you advanced to the level where you were a, uh, a Pharisee and you were a member of the Sanhedrin, you probably had memorized most of the Old Testament at one time or another in Hebrew. 
Can you imagine that? So that's why we think that Paul probably had all that in his memory. Yep. And just had to rearrange his thinking. Fruit basket a paradigm upset. shift. Yep. Fruit basket upset. He had to, wow. You mean this? You mean that? Oh, yeah, well, look, this fits together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Except it took him a long time to do that. It took him almost three years to think about it. So we should notice that the four books that are most commonly quoted in the New Testament are Genesis, Deuteronomy that we're focusing on this quarter, Psalms, and Isaiah. So those are the four books that are most commonly quoted. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Galatians, as well as 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Hebrews, the pastoral epistles, and Revelation all refer back to Deuteronomy. There are only a few books in the New Testament that do not refer back to Deuteronomy. Now, we mentioned those, the names of those books because they very specifically quote Deuteronomy. It's interesting to notice that one of the very first things that Jesus did in his ministry was to face off with Satan in the wilderness temptations. We know about that. Um, notice what ammunition Jesus used. Jim? Matthew 4, verses 1 to, to 11. Then the Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After spending 40 days and nights without food, Jesus was hungry. Then the devil came to him and said, If you are God's son, order these stones to turn, to bre turn into bread. Jesus answered, The scripture says human beings cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that God speaks. And where does that come from? Deuteronomy. Go ahead. Then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, the holy city, set him on the highest point of the temple, and said to him, If you are God's son, throw yourself down, for the scripture says, God will give orders to his angels about you. They will hold you up with their hands, so that not even your feet will be hurt on the stones. Jesus and, answered. And where does that come from? Deuteronomy again. Go ahead. Jesus answered. But the scripture also says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. I'm sorry, that's the one that's from Deuteronomy. Go ahead. Then the devil took Jesus to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in all their great, greatness. And this I will give you, the devil said, if you kneel down and worship me. Wow. Then Jesus answered, Go away, Satan. The scripture says, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only him. Then the devil left Jesus, and the angels came and helped him. American Bible Society, 1992. Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, 6, verse 16, 6, verse 13, in answer to the devil's temptations. Now, you know, he was God. He didn't have to quote Deuteronomy. Why was he quoting Deuteronomy? Well, hopefully that some of the people later would be hear about it would recognize them that it was coming from the book of Deuteronomy and had some... Uh, okay, so what is he saying? He's he saying... as an example to us. For yes. Us. Yeah. And here he's saying, look, I don't have to speak on my own behalf. Here's what the scripture says. Anybody who is a good Jew will recognize this as valid information. I'm quoting from Deuteronomy. They've and, heard it before. Yeah. They, they had no excuse for not being you know, familiar with it. If Jesus used three passages from Deuteronomy in one of the most important conflicts of his ministry and life on this earth, shouldn't that be a clue about how important Deuteronomy and the rest of the Old Testament are for us? Think of all the people who think they can just throw out the Old Testament. Now, what do they, what do they do with all these quotations that Jesus had from from the Old Testament? They don't know. They they haven't they haven't studied seriously. That. I most of the people. Oh, Jesus said it. The idea that it came from Deuteronomy. Who ever heard of that? And so many of them. It, that was, it was, even though Deuteronomy is in what we call the Pentateuch, but most of them are, is into the. Uh, the, into the Pentateuch. They don't read the prophets. Yeah. Yeah. They got some uh, sacred writings that they put uh, to the, to the uh, reading of the 
penetrate. I will, I will tell you a very sad story, personally. I was on my way to Europe uh, to spend the summer working in a factory there with a friend. And in the process, we, we, were, we had a weekend. We had, we had driven across the country with some friends and dropped off in New York City, waiting for our flight to take off on Sunday to take us to Europe. And so we decided, oh, well, here we are. And we heard about a famous church, I won't mention it by name, a famous church in New York City. We thought, not an Adventist church. Well, let's, let's go and hear what the preacher has to say. And we went there and uh, he had quite a nice sermon. It was a good sermon. And he, his sermon was all from Colossians 20, verse 20. There ain't none. Huh? There ain't no, no, <laughs> there, there is, is no such thing. There is no such thing. He was quoting from, from 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20, but his audience, he figured they, so few of them had any knowledge of scripture, they didn't even realize this. And he didn't want them to think, you're quoting from the Old Testament, oh dear. You know, Colossians 2020. Mm -hmm. We wrote him a letter saying, we happen to notice that you quoted Colossians 2020. We got a letter back, a form letter back says, we hope the next time when you're in New York City, you'll come and visit us again. Yeah. <laughs> so that, would that give you a clue, Gordon, about how they feel about the Old Testament? Um, Deuteronomy, that's the Old Testament. He certainly, this is Jesus, certainly recognized the truth of Hebrews 4, 12. Carrie, I think that's yours. The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts all the way through to where soul and spirit meet, to where joints and marrow come together. It judges the desires and thoughts of the hearts. It's from the Good News Bible. Okay, so Jesus says, I will quote from Deuteronomy because it goes right to the point. It meets the enemy. Look at the three passages from Deuteronomy which Jesus used. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. He made you go hungry, and then he gave you manna to eat, food that you and your ancestors had never eaten before. He did this to teach you that human beings must not depend on bread alone to sustain them, but on everything that the Lord says. Good News Bible. Okay. And Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test, as you did in Massa, the Good News Bible. And in Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. Honor the Lord your God, worship only Him, and make your promises in His name alone. Okay. So, Jesus says, to give authority to his word, he quoted what people knew as truth. R people recognize that these are true. These are things that they memorized in school. And, I'm, and Jesus obviously had them memorized. Another very important message from the Old Testament, and particularly from Deuteronomy, is found in Deuteronomy 10, 17 to 19. Gordon? The Lord your God is supreme over all gods and over all powers. He is great and mighty, and he is to be feared. That is to be reverenced. Yeah. He does not show partiality, and he does not accept bribes. He makes sure that orphans and widows are treated fairly. He loves the foreigners who live with our people and gives them food and clothes. So then, show love for those foreigners, because you were once foreigners in Egypt. Does that mean that we should be having a major effort to take care of the homeless? Well, we've had uh, several passages on that very topic, and mm -hmm. remember Ezekiel 18, yeah. excuse me, Ezekiel 16, uh, criticism of Sodom and Gomorrah was because they weren't taking care of the widows and the orphans. Yep. I thought it was for another reason. I know, it, traditionally that's <laughs> one that sticks out. No, that There's was, more that than was one an reason. amazing thing that I saw from Ezekiel. Yeah, The phrase shows no partiality is translated from a Hebrew figure of speech. What's a figure of speech? It's a metaphor. A metaphor. It's a word that, that means something and often they don't have any they don't make any sense at all. It just 
if you just take the words literally. But we, we recognize them as, as referring to something different than what they immediately say. So what's the case here? So many times hyper, hyperbole. Sometimes that too. Uh, this Hebrew expression, which is translated, shows no partiality, is translated from Hebrew figure of speech. It means literally that he does not lift up faces. Lift up faces. What do you suppose that means? Here's an example. It doesn't make any sense just by itself, does it? This is believed to have come from a legal setting in which the judge or king sees the face of the person on trial and says, oh, that's a friend of mine, or that guy's got money, or whatever, and so what does he do? Based on that person's status, important person or some, someone insignificant, the judge or king renders a verdict. So in other words, what happens there? He was bribed or he was, you know, this isn't, he's not fair. The implication here in Deuteronomy is that the Lord doesn't treat people in such a manner, despite his great power and might, he's fair with everyone, regardless of their status. This truth, of course, was revealed in the life of Jesus and how he, <clears throat> how he treated even though the most despised in society. And just to give an example, who would be the most despised in the society in Jesus' day? The Samaritans. Well, the Samaritans, the he was kind collectors. to them. Who else? The tax collectors. The tax collectors? Any I'm Gentile. Any Gentile. I'm still thinking of someone else who was very much despised. Lepers. The lepers. What about them? Uh, still like that. And Jesus, and I, 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 you know, I, I, I smile every time I think, I worked, with, I worked at a leprosarium for a number of years in Africa, not just a leprosarium, that was a part of a bigger hospital. So we had to do leprosy and other things like this. And so I, I had a special interest in, in leprosy. And I, you know, if you touched a leper, even touched a leper in Jesus' day, you were considered to be unclean. But when Jesus touched them, they weren't leprous anymore. <laughs> you know, you know, do you say, "Oh, Jesus, you're contaminated"? No, you're not, because as soon as He touches them, they're not they're not lepers anymore. What about the barul ulcers? Is that part of it? It seems like this one goes with the other. I, I would have seen, to go back and look at that. I hadn't seen that word at all before, but it's there and and. Uh, Mm. Leprosy is certainly still around. Yeah, some places, not many. Yeah. There's good treatments for it. If, if you get someone and you find out they've got it and you get them fairly early and you treat them. Yeah, well, I've never heard of the barul ulcers, but it seems like one goes with the other. Yeah. Notice how the ideas of Deuteronomy 10 are used repeatedly by Luke, Paul, and even Peter. We're talking about being fair to the poor and the downcast and so forth. That would be mine, I guess. Acts 10, 34, Peter began to speak. I now realize that it is true that God treats everyone on the same basis. And who's he talking about there? Acts 10. Cornelius, the Roman centurion. Romans 2, 11, for God judges everyone by the same standard. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles there. Galatians 2, 6, but those who seem to be the leaders, I say this because it makes no difference to me what they were, God does not judge by outward appearances. Those leaders, I say, made no new suggestions to me. And who's Paul talking about there? Peter, James, and maybe John. He's talking about the church leaders Ooh. in his day. Oh, dear. We can't apply that today, can we? Oh, of course not. Ephesians 6, 9, Masters, behave in the same way towards your slaves and stop using threats. Remember that you and your slaves belong to the same master in heaven. Now, it's, he's not talking about you got you were slaves in Egypt anymore. He says, you do what? <clears throat> you belong to the same master in heaven who judges everyone by the same standard. And then Colossians 3, 25, and wrongdoers will be repaid for the wrong things they do because God judges everyone by the same standard. First Peter 1 Peter 1.17 
You call him father when you pray to God, who judges all people by the same standard according to which each one has done. So then spend the rest of your lives here on earth in reverence for him. And the Bible in a number of places, in Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, in two or three places in the book of Revelation, in some places in, in Paul's writings, God says, okay, I'm gonna judge everybody by the same standard. And what is that standard? What are we all judged against? Truth. The truth. Well, the truth is set out in the Bible, really, right? Yeah. But don't those of us who know more about it, aren't we judged by a higher standard? What do we do with the text that Jesus says, I judge no one. It's the words I have spoken will be your judge. Well, and that's what I just said. We're judged by the standard we're judged by is the Bible. Yeah. Those are the but words. Not, every, not all the words in the Bible are... <laughs> Or uh, Jesus' words. Yeah, well, you, you know, the Bible quotes the devil a few times. That's right. If God refuses to show any partiality based on externals, that means bribes or, or appearance or wealth or any of those things, then surely we should not either. The, that idea is spelled out clearly in James 2 as well. God does not place us on different levels when it comes to salvation. We are either saved or we are not saved. There's only two categories. Every one of us who enters heaven will do so because of God's mercy and grace. In ancient times, when a conquering nation was attacked and sieged, sieging a weaker nation, think about how many times was Jerusalem sieged? Too many. Too many is the right answer. They often crucified or just stuck up on poles the dead bodies of those who had been tried to escape, who try, had tried to escape in order to threaten the people inside the city even further. The Romans who attacked Jerusalem in AD 70, they would catch everybody who tried to escape from the city and at night times over like this, they would crucify them. At one point in time, the, the, the crosses, and they would just leave them set there and rot outside the city. The crosses were so, I mean, they were so thick that you could hardly walk between them. Dead bodies rotting away in the sun. People had tried to escape out of Jerusalem. Because they're mummifying them. It was hot sun. <laughs> hot sun doesn't mummify people. Well, Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23. Let's look at that for just a second. If someone has been put to death for a crime and his body is hung on a post, it is not to remain there overnight. It must be buried the same day because a dead body hanging on a post brings God's curse on the land. Bury the body so that you will not defile the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Is that why the what? Jewish or that their tradition is to be buried within... Yep, 24 hours. Or the same day, isn't it? Same day, as much as possible, yeah. Um, and look at 20... Well, these two passages clearly state that this should never happen. And why did it, who did it happen to, of course? To Jesus himself. And we, in our modern, with our modern sensibilities and so forth, always have Jesus draped with something... I can tell you, he was not draped with anything. He was totally uncovered, totally nude, hanging on that cross. And why was that? The purpose of, a, of the Roman crucifixion was to make it as obnoxious and as ab horrible as possible so that no one else, because it, it was the crime, it was the treatment for a supposedly a traitor to the government. Yeah. And they wanted that people not even to think of trying to do anything against the government. Even if the person is put to death because of some crime he has committed, Paul used that idea in Galatians 3, 1 to 14 to emphasize the horror of what happened to Jesus. And he said, okay, we talked about this. And who was it that was hung on a cross? It was Jesus. So, Jim, I think this is yours, is it? Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14. But by becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings. 
for the scripture says, anyone who is hanged on a tree is under God's curse. Christ did this in order that the blessing which God promised to Abraham might be given to the Gentiles by means of Jesus Christ so that through him we might receive the spirit promised by God. Good News Bible. Jesus Christ's life and his death are a lesson for us. One, we can choose to live a life as far as possible with his help, like his life, or two, we will die the death he died separated from God, the only source of life. The fact that he died and what it can teach us make it possible for us to be saved and go to heaven. That is what substitution really means. And I can tell you, and I don't, don't need to tell you, I think most of you are already aware, we have beat this idea of substitution to all kinds of levels. Uh, how exactly what it means and legal implications and all that kind of stuff. It's really simple. Jesus died, and if we understand all what that means and we take advantage of it, we don't have to die. That's substitution. Doesn't How many he... understand why he died? What? How many of us understand why he died? That's the how problem. Many, how many... That's the problem. Yeah. What does it mean to you to say that Christ became a curse for us? Well, if you're hung on a cross, you know, like that, that's, that's a curse. We all know that we are sinners, and as sinners without the mercy and grace of God, we would all die as a result of our sins. That is, well, you, don't, you know this, but let me just look at it again. Sin pays its wage, death. But God's free gift is eternal life and union with Christ Jesus our Lord. So, what is it that causes the death of sinners? Sin. It's the sin. We, but we also know that the gift of God is eternal life. Okay, I think this is yours, Carrie. Okay. None but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. Christ would take upon himself the guilt and shame of sin, Sin so offensive to a holy God that it must separate the Father and his Son. This is from E.G. White, Patriots and Prophet, page 63, paragraph 2. Okay, if we go back to Isaiah 59, verse 2, what does sin do to us? It separates us from our God. Mm -hmm. And so God said, okay, if you are completely separated from God, it's, it's curtains for you, that's it. But my son has divinity within himself, so he can, as a human being, as a human and as a divine, he can die the death that, that, that's the result of separation, which we call the second death, and yet when an angel comes and calls him, he can rise with the power he has because he's divine. However, so that's talking about how Jesus died on our behalf and all that's good, However, let us never forget that the life and death of Christ were for the benefit of the entire universe, not just for human beings. Myra? Yes, continuing on in Patriarchs and Prophets. But the plan of redemption had not a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it is to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of the other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now, this now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from this earth, will draw all unto me. John 12, 31 and 32. Let me interrupt there for a second. What did he put, what does Alan White put as the number one reason? The impact on the rest of the universe. And then about for us too. Okay, go ahead. Um, the act of Christ dying for, salvation, for the salvation of man 
would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. It's from Patriarchs and Prophets, mm -hmm. page 68. Yep. And it's interesting that in Reflecting Christ, it says, which it says, will draw all men unto me. In the King James Version. Quoting the King James Version instead of what Ellen White used. Mm -hmm. Draw all the unto me. is in italics in yes. the older King James. Yeah. Which, which means that it was added. Yeah. yeah. So when Ellen White did Patriarchs and Prophets herself, she, put, she left the men out. She says, it will draw all, uh, and if I, I, if I be lifted up upon, from the earth, will draw all unto me. And she left out men intentionally. But later, when we quote her in other places, we tend to put it back in because we think maybe she made a mistake. No, she didn't make a mistake. They're the ones who tried to put it back in. They're the ones that are making the mistake. That excludes the beings of all the rest of the universe. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever stopped to think what kind of a death you deserve because of your sins? Good News Bible, Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 8. Obey them faithfully, and this will show the people of other nations how wise you are. When you hear of all these laws, they will say, what wisdom and understanding this great nation has. No other nation, no matter how great, has a God who is so near when they need him as the Lord our God is to us. He answers us whenever we call for help. No other nation, no matter how great, has laws so just as those that I have taught you today. Okay, let me interrupt there for a second. I mean, I don't know exactly what kind of, of communication there was back in those days and how long it took for people, the mother nations, to, to discover you know, the history of how God got the children of Israel out of Egypt. I mean, you know, the, the, the king of Egypt is destroyed and his army is destroyed and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wasn't and all the, the plagues. News? What? Wasn't that on cable news? Yeah, of course. I mean, they had to, that, but that, that information got around. I mean, and, and I mean, Rahab gives us an example when she says, everybody's scared to death of you. We, we, we know what God did for you. So, go ahead. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, don't follow the disgusting practices of the nations that are there. Don't sacrifice your children in the fires on, the, on your altars. And don't let your people practice divination or look for omens or use spells or charms. And don't let them consult the spirits of the dead. The Lord your God hates people who do these disgusting things, and that is why he is driving those nations out of the land as you advance. Be completely faithful to the Lord. Okay. Then Moses said, In the land you are about to occupy, people follow the advice of those who practice divination and look for omens, but the Lord your God does not allow you to do this. Instead, he will send you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you are to obey him. Okay, so God is choosing to take the children of Israel into the land of Palestine, land of Canaan there, and what does he see as the huge risk in doing that? That they take up the practices of the people that are already there in that land, the heathen. And he knew that that was going to happen. Was that a mistake on the God's land, part? The land where Abraham converted lots of people, but apparently not enough. Yeah. Yeah. And so Moses writes, he said, look, don't accept any of their religious practices. Dr let me drive them out. That was, what, that was his original plan in Exodus 23. Let me drive them out. I'll chase them out, and then you can, you can work on converting them from outside your country. And he says, eventually, I will solve that problem by sending you a prophet, and of course, who is that prophet? Jesus himself, God himself. Yeah. Please note a very important explanation of those paragraphs. God does not hate any of his children. 
if you look back up here, it says what? Yes. The Lord your God hates people who do these disgusting things. And that is why he's driving those nations out of the land as you advance. Okay, I'm going to say, and I'm going to explain now, God does not hate any of his children. But it what he hates, he what? But it says he does. Yeah, it says that. I'm going to explain why. What he hates is the sin that is destroying them. If your child is dying of cancer, do you hate your child or do you hate the cancer? Yeah. When people follow the practices of the devil and repeatedly choose his way of doing things, then God's wrath must fall on them. He must let them go to reap the natural consequences of their own rebellious choices if they persist in those choices. And if you do it any other way, would anybody learn? If you bail out people, they don't yeah. learn what the, how the consequences work. Yeah. And it isn't that God is imposing, he just lets life happen. God's wrath is his turning away from those who don't want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. I mean, that's, that's what, I mean, and he weeps. We have examples that he weeps as people run away from him. Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 20. Instead, he will send you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you are to obey him. We just looked at that. In other words, follow the example of Jesus. Don't follow Satan's ways. On the day that you were gathered at Mount Sinai, you begged not to hear the Lord speak again or to see his fiery presence anymore because you were afraid you would die. Did God really need to scare them that bad? Yes. Was it too bad? Did he scare them too much? He scared them so much that it took them about a couple of weeks before they were dancing drunk and naked around the golden calf. Yeah. They didn't do it immediately. It yeah. took them two weeks. This is weeks. one of numerous examples in the Bible when God, God demonstrates that you can scare people and they will temporarily, oh, yes, whatever the God says we will do. But it never lasts. Scaring people do, is not, I mean, if it was possible to scare people to death and have them remain permanently converted by doing that, God would have done that in the days of Adam and Eve. It doesn't work. So he, again, he says, I will send them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will tell them what to say, I will tell him what to say, and he will tell people everything I command. He will speak in my name, and I will punish anyone who refuses to obey him. But if any prophet dares to speak a message in my name when I did not command him to do so, he must die for it, and so must any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods. If you remember our lesson from last week, the story of Josiah, what happened to that younger prophet? He died because he accepted the words of an older prophet who lied to him. He didn't consult God. He didn't consult God. While Moses in Deuteronomy did not mention Satan or the great controversy, he clearly spelled out what will happen to those who reject God's guidance and follow the devil's biddings. The devil will use any means he can to deceive and mislead humans, including the use of prophets that promote his agenda. Do we have any of those people talking and speaking and preaching today? Absolutely. That would, what do you have when you got 43,000 Christian denominations in the world? Uh, what percentage are, are, have the truth? It's very interesting to notice that almost immediately after the giving of the Ten Commandments, as recorded in Exodus 20, 3 through 17, and then starting with the next verse, verses 18 to 21, the children of Israel begged for someone to stand between them and God because hearing God's voice scared them to death. Now, why do you suppose that was true? Moses wasn't scared. Where had they come from? They'd been slaves. They had been slaves. And they were used to people with power beating them and torturing them and whatever, get them to do what they were. 
So they had never seen anybody with this kind of power before. And so, boy, you know, you better line up, right? It is important to notice that it was not, not, notice the, not, the little N-O-T there, it was not God's idea to have an intercessor between himself and his children. He himself wants to be our friend. Jesus, who was God himself, did not need anyone between himself and his disciples or even the rest of the Jewish people. John 15, 15. Jesus said, I do not call you servants any longer. That's slaves. The real word is slaves. Because servants or slaves do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends. Not with your faces down in the dirt because you're scared to death. Because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. That is not a hierarchical vertical relationship that's no. horizontal horizontal the creator right. of the universe spoke to his yep. disciples that way a short time later in that same evening the last supper evening jesus said i have used figures of speech to tell you these things but the time will come when i will not use figures of speech but will speak to you plainly about the father now i don't know but if you really believe that the scriptures is for the purpose of teaching us about God. Isn't that what it's for? This is, this is information from God. He's trying to teach us about himself. So now the Son of God, Jesus himself, a divine being, wants to speak plainly about the Father. And what is he going to say? You better be scared to death, right? When that day comes, when I speak plainly about the Father, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf, your behalf because the Father himself loves you. How many people believe that God is sitting up there with a scowl on his face and a big stick just waiting to zap people who get out of line? You've heard that read by prominent ministers. That's right. That the word not is left out. Is, is, is not there. Yeah. And when you get done with that passage, the disciple says to him, Oh, now you're talking in plainly and not in any riddles. Yeah. He loves you. The Father loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. That's the kind of relationship that God wants from us. Both Luke in the book of Acts and Peter later spoke about God using words from the prophets who lived long ago. Stephen also did, Stephen also did so. Jim? Acts 3, 19 to 21. Repent then and turn to God so that he will forgive your sins if you, sins. If you do, times of spiritual strength will come from the Lord and he will send Jesus who is Messiah. He will he has already chosen you. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for all things to be made new. And God announced through his holy prophets who lived long ago. Goodness, Bible. So, Ex go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I mean, the point is, Peter in that very famous sermon says, we're quoting something from prophets long ago because it's recognized as authority, right? That's the point here. Acts 7, 37. Moses is the one who said to the people of Israel, God will send you a prophet just as he sent me, and he will and will be one of your own people. Good news, Bible. Rejecting God and rejecting the offer of Jesus will indeed lead to weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 12, I'm sorry, Matthew 22, 13. Some have considered the book of Hebrews just one long exhortation to young Jewish believers and Jesus to encourage them to stay faithful to the Lord. And I can tell you that uh, next quarter will be, the whole quarter will be on the book of Hebrews. Choosing to act selfishly by following the example of Satan will eventually take us so far away from God's love that he will have to let us go. Further details are given in Hebrews 10, 28 to 31. Okay, what kind of things can happen to you if you run far away from God and you disobey, etc., etc.? Reading from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 28 through 31. 
Anyone who disobeys the law of Moses is put to death without any mercy when judged guilty of the evidence of two or more witnesses. What then of those who despise the Son of God, who treat as a cheap thing the blood of God's covenant which purified them from sin, who insult the Spirit of grace? Just think how much worse is the punishment they will deserve. For we know who said, I will take revenge, I will repay, and who also said, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God from the Good News Bible. Now let's back up a second. If God loves you, the Son loves you, the Father loves you, would it be a terrifying thing to fall into his hands? Well... What happens if you love your child and they fall into your hands? Yeah. Okay, drop down about two chapters, and what do we read here? Hebrews 12, verses 28 and 29. Let us be thankful then, because we receive the kingdom that, is, that cannot be shaken. Let us be grateful and worship God in a way that will please him with reverence and awe, because our God is indeed a destroying fire. Okay, now, if, if, if someone tells you that they are, quote, by definition, a destroying fire, does that make you want to run up there and give them a hug? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> but we just read from John that he wants to be our friend. But we read in Hebrews that he's a destroying fire. Our God is indeed a destroying fire. So how do we put these together? Is God love or is he a destroying fire? Bad question. <laughs> he's both. Well, what does that mean? It means that sin cannot exist in God's presence. It just cannot exist in God's presence. So... If you cling to your sin, what's going to happen? It's going to destroy you. And God becomes to you a destroying fire. If you're willing to give up your sin, what happens? That's an interesting uh, way of saying it, Ken. Uh, is that really descriptive, that, that verse uh, 29, descriptive God? Or is it how the results, how it, uh, what it does well, is, is the result of sin it mm -hmm. destroys you? Yeah, well, yes, exactly. God's glory at the end will pour out and those people who are out of harmony with it will be destroyed. And they call they call for the rocks and yeah. to, to fall on them, but it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. it's kind of like driving down the freeway and all of a sudden you see people t putting their brakes on and slowing down and you're just driving along going, I don't see any problem. And then you see the highway patrolman go by. <laughs> I haven't got anything to worry about. I was doing what was right. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. In fact, the best thing that could happen to us is to fall into the hands of a loving God. But, now we have to give a come with a but, God must eventually destroy sin if we cling to sin well. I mean, as Jim has just pointed out, it's actually sin that destroys it. It destroys us itself. itself. It is not God who destroys sin, sinners. It is sin. Romans 6.23. You mentioned God doesn't need to make sin any worse than it already is. Yeah. Sin pays its way to death, right? Yeah. That's exactly what Romans 6.23 in the Good News Bible says. For sin pays its wage, death. But God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. So now you can see both sides. It's a free gift, it's eternal life and so forth, but the other side is sin pays its wage. God is extremely hesitant to give up any of his children. The only thing that will cause him to let them go is their own choice. That is, if they repeatedly choose the devil's selfish side. In our day, we have so much more light available to us than any of the Bible authors did. How could we turn away and reject all that evidence of God's saving grace? One can learn a great deal, too, quoting now, 
One can learn a great deal, too, about how to interpret the Bible by how the inspired writers of the New Testament use the Old. And one of the first lessons we could learn is that, unlike so much Bible scholarship today, the New Testament writers never raised any question about the authenticity or authority of the Old Testament books. Nothing in their writings revealed, for instance, doubt about the historicity of the Old Testament stories, from the existence of Adam and Eve, the fall and the flood, to the call of Abraham, and so forth. The scholarship that questions these things is just human skepticism, and it should have no place in the hearts and minds of Seventh-day Adventists from our Bible study guide for Friday, December 17. So what can we conclude about the use of Deuteronomy in the New Testament? Some scholars have compared Deuteronomy to the Book of Romans. Jim? We find in Deuteronomy the theological tension between the rigor of the law and the good news of the grace of God. It is from the book of Deuteronomy that Paul draws the idea that the law reveals, in, reveals sin, Romans 7.7, 7, that the righteousness is only by faith, Romans 1, 17, 10, 6, 8, and 17. Compare Deuteronomy 30, 12 to 14, and the hope of that someday God's people will join as one with the Gentiles, Romans 15, 10. Compare Deuteronomy 32, 43. This is why the book of Deuteronomy has been compared to the book of Romans in the New Testament. This week's study is devoted to the place and significance of the book of Deuteronomy in the New Testament. So I hope that in our discussions together and what we've read so far from this lesson, that you're beginning to see that you, there's really no way you can tear the Old Testament and the New Testament apart. To try to get rid of the Old Testament and stick with the New Testament, if you, if you take all the New Testament, you're, you're, you're accepting much of the Old Testament. In this lesson, we have talked about the use of the expression, it is written. We have mentioned people who encourage us to live by the word and to understand the relationship between law and grace. Finally, we discussed the issue of who was a prophet like me. Now, specifically, the passive form of the verb in the expression, it is written, what does it mean, the passive form in, the, in, in this expression? What's the passive form? Something that was acted upon. Okay, so it doesn't say, we're not talking about he writes, we're talking about something is written. Okay, so it doesn't identify the person who did the writing, it just says it is written. So this indicates the grammatical intention to imply the divine subject behind these writings. So in other words, when we say it is written, we talk about the Bible, we're really implying behind that that there's a common author all the way through the Bible, and that would be God himself. It is interesting that not only Jesus, but also Satan refers to the inspired scriptures, and both uses, use the conventional, it is written, to introduce their quotations. But only Jesus, not Satan, points to God. The devil focuses only on the miracle, and God is not important in his theology. God is to be defeated in his theology. Jesus, on the other hand, focuses on God, whom alone we should worship, Matthew 4.10. For it is possible to know that, scriptures, uh, that the scriptures well and quote them all the time and yet ignore or even reject the God who inspired them. So now, we, we mentioned earlier that people in the Old Testament times uh, the young boys who went to school, did what, what was one of the things that they did a lot of? Memorize the scripture. Memorizing the scripture. And so all the Pharisees who had memorized the scripture, maybe the entire Old Testament in their training, were saints, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so the fact that you memorize it and and you, if you choose to interpret it and read it the way others do, and you're using this idea, then doesn't mean doesn't mean you're, you know, we need to take it the way the way God intends for it to be taken. 
We noticed in our study last week that whoever was the leader of the people, especially if it was a king, was supposed to keep a copy of Deuteronomy beside him and read it and have it read to him every day. Think about other passages of scripture such as Joshua 1, 8, and if we had time we would look at those, but you know, there's many of them. Joshua 1, 8, 1 Kings 2, 3, Nehemiah 10, 34, Mark 9, 13, Acts 1, 20, 1 Corinthians 1, 19, that talk about how we need to focus on the scriptures, we need to read them on a daily basis, we need to understand them, we need to apply them to our lives. And Jesus answered to Satan, recorded in Matthew 4, 4, he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The original Hebrew from Deuteronomy 8.3 carries additional implications that are very significant. The Hebrew text says literally, man shall live on all that will come out from the mouth of God. What comes out from the mouth of God? The Hebrew verse also alludes to God's creation of human beings. What Moses was emphasizing was that it was from God's mouth, not from bed, bread, that humans receive life. It was important that the Israelites understand this lesson. Spoiled by the manna that fell regularly and surely on the ground. The Israelites got used to that natural provision and may have indeed forgotten that it came from God. I mean, if, I mean, and, and let's think about that for a moment. Suppose you had gone out, you were born somewhere out there on that journey, and every day you went out there and there was the manna, you just picked it up. It might be pretty easy to start thinking, oh, that, that's just natural. We don't know where that comes from. It's just natural. Well, um, Satan that, uh, Jesus reminds Satan that even the power of the miracle was not the point, but the person of God himself was. What really matters is remembering the one who's behind all of these activities. But we, uh, do we understand clearly why keeping the law can never save us? There's one simple answer. None of us can actually keep it. Dropping down, um, when Moses spoke about a prophet like me that was to come, he was clearly referring to Jesus Christ. The New Testament apostles recognized that. Are we willing to live according to the suggestions of Moses and Jesus Christ? Do we recognize that this is a life or death matter? How do we observe the Sabbath? Do we pay, basically pay our tithe? What other things that we could mention are testing issues in our day? Are we studying our Bibles daily and praying and witnessing? I will leave that question with you. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these records that spell out in so much detail the things that we should be doing every day. Help us to take up the challenge, to take up our crosses and bear them, whatever they are, in the process of carrying out all these things that you've asked us to do as we faithfully should, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.